Our scripture lesson today is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And if you'll open your Bible or if you're following along in a Bible app, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And if you'll leave that open because we're going through the morning to be reading through the first 12 verses and um, commenting on them. And so you'll want to leave your Bible app open. You'll want to leave the Bible open. Those of you who are watching online in the comment description section, you'll find the link to the sermon notes and you can download them and follow along with us as well. In 2019, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary added the word influencer to the dictionary. It was a term that is used on social media of somebody who has access to a large or a niche audience and can persuade others. Some of them are celebrities, but many of them are just, quote, ordinary people who have come to be, be social media celebrities because they've gained a large following. So a little history. I, I didn't know all this. 2005 is when YouTube started. And by 2009, the social media world was introduced to the influencer phenomenon. Didn't have a word for it then, but it was out there. It started with bloggers and YouTubers writing about things that they used, clothes they wore, uh, equipment they bought, whatever. In 2010, Instagram was launched and it gave users the ability to connect to one another in more real time and they would post pictures and share products that they enjoyed. And before long, influencers were using this platform to connect with the people that followed them on a, on a different level. Um, I, I don't know if you're on Instagram, but you, know, you, you look at it and there's some soccer player in his hotel room saying, man, after that match we just had, I am so glad that I had such and such a snack waiting on me in the hotel room. That was just, you know, anything. Oh, he uses that. Maybe if I ate that, you know, I'd become a soccer player too. And, and it was those kind of things. Somebody was on the road a lot in their kitchen saying, man, when I get off the road, I'm so glad when I have the new delivery from, you know, whatever food service. And you think, ah, what do you know? Maybe I should do that. Well, that's what's happening on Instagram. And by 2013, Instagram introduced a way to do paid advertisements. And so with just watching that video, you think, oh, this is what I'm going to do. Then came Twitch in 2011. That was a whole different thing. And Twitch was not so much how many people followed you, but Twitch had the niche audience. Uh, it started off with gaming, live stream gaming. And, and what younger people than me tell me on this, because I don't know anything about Twitch except the one I develop once in a while, but it is that people are sitting there playing video games with a camera and you can watch them play the video games. So I guess if you don't have the energy to play the video game yourself, you can watch somebody else play it. But then what was happening was they were saying, this is the game I'm playing. This is the computer I'm using. This is the chair I'm using. You know, this is the energy drink I've got. And so they were influencing this niche audience of gamers. And now that's, it's gone more into other things as well. So that is a whole other level of social media influencers. And then TikTok came in 2020. I don't know anything about that either. But I do know this. Currently, they are projecting that influencer marketing in 2022 will be a 15 billion, with a B, dollar industry. If you'd like to know which Bible I use, uh, you know, which cough drop I use, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to get in on that. But, you know, it, it's, and, and most companies today have at least a percentage of their advertising budget geared toward the digital aspect of social media influencers. It got so bad even that by 2009, for the first time in almost 30 years, the FTC revised its guidelines 
about endorsements and testimonials. Because what people didn't realize when they saw the soccer player with his snack or somebody with their food preparation is that those people were getting that stuff either free or they were getting paid to endorse it. And so the FTC said, you can't even use social media to do this without disclosing the relationship. So you'll see things like hashtag sponsored or hashtag ad or hashtag paid partnership with. That's an FTC regulation that says to people paying attention, I'm using this because they're giving it to me, you know, and I might use it, but it's not costing me what it's going to cost you to use. And, and, and I had, I know you're wondering, what in the world does this have to do with First Thessalonians chapter 2? Because Paul, it's amazing the impact he had without being on social media. But, but Paul, in, in chapter 2, talks about the impact that the Thessalonian believers were having in their world. And it, it took me back to the sermon I preached from chapter 1 in verses 7 through 9 where he says, You became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, and the Lord's message rang out from you so that your faith in God has become known everywhere. Now that's being an influencer. So I'm working on chapter 2 and I'm writing down all these sentences and um, points and I don't have any frame to put it around or, or to put in it. And then I found a sermon by Phil Moser, don't know anything about him, but he quoted John Maxwell's famous quote, leadership is influence. And he says, you look at chapter 2 and you're looking at people who are spiritual influencers. I said, ah, that's what this is about. And it really is. And so the light went on in my little brain and, and I started thinking about social influencers and then being a spiritual influencer. Now, a couple of very important insights before we go any further. In verse 4, Paul says that we were approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. That is a challenging phrase to be entrusted with the gospel the word means to approve somebody as fit for public office in other words what he's saying is god has tested me god has approved me and he has entrusted me with the gospel i appreciate the fact that so many of you pray for me regularly because it is if, if I let myself really dwell on it, it is an overwhelming burden to be before you every week preaching the gospel. Because I need to get it right. And I need to make sure that God who entrusts me with the gospel approves what I say. And verse 12 is the goal of, of a spiritual influence. We urge you to live lives worthy of God. That's the goal of a spiritual influencer. To live worthy of God means to live appropriately, to live in harmony with God, to live in obedience to God. So our goal, if we're a follower of Christ, is to use whatever influence we have to motivate other people to live their lives in a way as to please God, to live worthy to be called by his name. Now let me just take a minute to talk about influence, because you may think you don't have any influence. I'm retired, I'm at home, I don't have any influence. Each of us has influence. If, if there's just two of you in the home, you both have influence because you all know it takes one person having a bad day to influence the house, right? I mean, it just, that's influence. Uh, you influence the people you do business with, uh, the people you talk to on the telephone when you're trying to get a service call or something, or um, the, the server that takes care of you at a restaurant, whatever interaction you have with people that's influence 
If you don't think you've got influence, you know, and you're on social media, you have influence. I, I saw somebody on Twitter a while back said, I took three weeks off to give myself a break from Twitter. This is my first day back. It's time to go again. You know, because just the, the, the negative influence that's out there. So let's be positive influencers. Let's be spiritual influencers to encourage people to live pleasing to God. To encourage people to take the next step in their search for God. So what does it take to be a spiritual influencer? Let's start reading with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority, but instead we were like young children among you. All right, let's look at this first part. What does it take to be a spiritual influencer? First, keep going when it's tough. I love what Paul says, with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. I think one of the most important things that we can influence people is to stick to it to be faithful, to use a Christian word, to be persistent. Now, let, let me say this to you. We, we live in a society where it's easy to quit. You know, just easy to just walk away. I have a bad day, somebody looks at me the wrong way, and I've just got my feelings hurt, and I'm offended, so I'm going to drop out. Well, we need to, to be better than that, but let me also say that there are times when it's time to quit. You know, there are times when it's time to walk away. And and this is not the word of the Lord for anybody today, but there are times in a job when the work is killing you, literally killing you. Might be time to look for something else. You know, there are times to quit. There are times to walk away. But one of the characteristics that we need to instill in our lives and influence in other people's lives is keep going when it's tough. Everybody has bad days. Everybody has tough days. Everybody has those days when it, it starts off bad, it just keeps getting worse, and you want to just throw up your hands and quit. Don't. Keep going. Paul said, you know what happened to us when we were in Philippi and how outrageously we were treated, but by the grace of God and the strength of God, we came to you and you know that with the help of God, we were faithful in preaching the gospel. We need to let people know that God values faithfulness. Keep doing what God calls you to do. Don't quit just because it gets tough. Persevere. Keep on going. Let people see faithfulness in your life. There's a challenging song that says, May those who come behind us find us faithful. You know, those of us who are Christians in 2022, we stand on the shoulders of people who kept going when it was tough. And they stand on the shoulders of people who kept going when it was tough. You know, think about people you know that influenced you and what influences you about them is their faithfulness to God, even through the challenging times of life. The greatest value in your testimony is not, God was with me when everything was great. No, the greatest value of your testimony is, God was with me through the toughest part of my life. And I stayed true to him with his help. And make sure that they know it's by the help 
of our God. It's not our strength, it's not our stamina, it's not our ability, it's by the help of our God that we were able to stay true. The second thing he says is that our message, verse 3, does not spring from error. If you're going to be a spiritual influencer, please make sure that the message is accurate. Years ago, I was at a preacher's school, and um, one of the speakers said this, and it just stuck in my mind because he said it so succinctly. He says, before you get the story out, make sure you get the story straight. <laughs> you know, And how important it is that the message is accurate. Have you ever heard error presented as gospel? <laughs> sure you have. And, uh, you know, speaking about social media as we are here today, you've got access to all kinds of stuff out there. I don't encourage you to do it, but every once in a while I sit down and go through the YouTube rabbit hole, you know, and watch this preacher for a while, watch that preacher for a while. Man, it's amazing what's out there under the guise of Christianity that has no relationship at all to what the Bible says. Make sure the message is accurate. I preached a sermon a year or so ago that said, no, God didn't say that. You know, we, we need to make sure that the message is accurate. Judge everything by the Bible. Make sure the message is accurate. But the preacher was so passionate when he said that. that. Was it right? Was it accurate? Is it backed up by the scriptures? That's the judge. You know, I hope that if you ever have a question about something I'm preaching, you get into the Word and check it out. And if I'm wrong, please let me know. Because it's important that the message is accurate. So many people do not follow Christ because what they have heard about Christianity is inaccurate. Well, you know, the Bible said, no, the Bible didn't say that. You know, and, and it's so important. Get the message straight. Judge everything by the word. Make sure it's accurate. And then he says our message didn't spring from impure motives. Make sure your motives are pure. This is, this is tough. You know, it goes back to what we mentioned in verse 4. We were entrusted with the gospel. We were approved by God. Motives are tricky. And, and I'll just suggest that if you wonder about your motives, you're probably okay if you wonder about them, you know, because people who have bad motives don't even think about it. But but it, it might be appropriate everyone says, Lord, you know, am I doing this the right way? Am I is my heart pure? Are my motives pure? You know, sometimes we do things because we're trying to prove a point. You know, sometimes we say things, we're not trying to be a witness, we're trying to say, gotcha. Um, you know, but and, and so Lord, help us to make sure that our motives are pure. And then he says our methods have to be above board. And, and he talks about we're trying to please God, not people. He said in Galatians chapter 1, if I was still trying to please men, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Our job is not to see how many followers we can get in social media. Our job is to please God. And so how do we do that? How do we make sure our methods are above board? In verse 3, he said, we're not trying to trick you. No tricks, no manipulation. That word trick is an interesting word. It's uh, a fisherman putting bait on a hook <laughs> to catch a fish. The poor little innocent fishy, oh, there's breakfast. No, it's not. You know. But he, he says, no tricks, no manipulation. There's a difference between motivation and manipulation. John Maxwell, I think, says it best. He says, when I manipulate people, I move them for my advantage. When I motivate people, I move them for their advantage. I think that's a pretty good distinction. Paul says, we're not using tricks. We're not trying to manipulate you. And he says, we're making sure that we try to please God. Not people, but God. Now, that doesn't mean you don't care for people. 
because we'll get in a minute to verses 7 and 8 that talks about as a mother, I'm going to care for you, I'm going to nourish you. You can care for people, but that doesn't mean you try to please them. Every parent knows that sometimes when you care for somebody, you have to do things that displease them. You know? and, and there's a difference between caring for somebody and trying to please them. Paul says, we're not out to win a popularity contest with you. We're not trying to please you. We're trying to please God. And in verse 5, he says, we never used flattery. Flattery is, is trying to make a good impression on somebody so that you can gain influence over them for selfish advantage. And then he says, no greed. Uh, we didn't enrich ourselves at your expense. Greed, the word here means to want more than you need doesn't mean that you didn't want your needs met. It means to want more than you need. And, and Paul talks about this later here in this passage we'll look at in a minute. And in other passages where he says, you know, I could have asked you to support me, but I didn't want to be a burden on you, and so I'm, I'm working with my hands the trade that I have. But in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 14, he says, the Lord has commanded those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So he's not saying it's wrong to financially support a minister. He's saying no greed. You know, don't don't amass riches to yourself. And we're seeing a lot of that in the world today. And then he sums up again in verse 6, I'm not self-seeking. I'm not here to exalt myself or assert my authority. I'm not looking for glory from you. I'm not trying to pull rank. So let's continue. The middle of verse 7. What does it mean to be a, social, a spiritual influencer? Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, there's that phrase again, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. To be an influencer over somebody spiritually includes being gentle as a mother. Be sensitive to their needs, to be concerned about their care and development. More and more, we're seeing abuse allegations coming out against churches and religious organizations. And it's just heartbreaking because that's the exact opposite of what God says we're supposed to be. We're supposed to look after people. We're supposed to care for people. We're supposed to nurture people. That should be our utmost concern. Church ought to be the safest place you could be. And we need to make sure in our lives that there is a gentleness about us, that there is a nourishment about us. I saw a little meme yesterday or today. Uh, to flourish, you must be nourished. And I, I like that. And we want people who are influenced by us to flourish in their walk with God. We need to be nourishing kind of people. You all know that there are people who when you leave them, you feel stronger. There are people when you leave them, you feel worn out. We need to be nourishing people. And Lord willing, in a couple weeks, it's Mother's Day. Donna's going to talk about this verse and expand on it uh, from her experiences. You want to make sure to be here or... Tune in on May the 8th. Be gentle as a mother. Then he continues, You know we not only shared the gospel with you, we shared our lives as well. If you're going to influence people, be willing to share your life. Probably what he was talking about was the fact that he worked with them in the marketplace. You remember he spoke at the Sabbath for three Sabbaths, then he got kicked out of the synagogue, and he went to the marketplace. And 
he's working shoulder to shoulder right alongside the other people in Thessalonica. The most impact you can have on somebody is living your life in front of them. You know, they, they don't listen so much to the words as they watch your actions. And as you share your life, as you're out there in the trenches with them, it makes a difference because that's how you have those teachable moments. You, you remember those incredibly wonderful serendipitous moments with your children when all of a sudden something turned into an incredibly teaching moment and it happened naturally and you couldn't schedule it now we're going to get together at seven o'clock tomorrow night and we're going to have a teachable moment no they come as you share life with them. That's why spending time is so important because as you spend time, those moments just come up in the course of living your life. And that's what Paul's saying. Discipleship is more than sharing a Bible study and filling in blanks. You know, discipleship is sharing your life. Do you remember what it says when Jesus called his disciples? It said, he called his disciples doesn't say so he could teach them, so he could instruct them, so he could train them. It says he chose his disciples that he might be with them. And as it was as he was with them that they learned. As they were with him, they saw him pray and said, Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. He didn't say I'm going to hold a seminar on prayer. They just watched him pray. So, oh, we need in on this. Be willing to share your life. Be willing to let people see what's going on. Part of that is be real. Verses 8 through 10. In other words, be authentic. He says, you remember our toil and our hardship. And we work night and day. And we were there. And you are our witnesses. And so is God. Be real. You know, when you're out in the marketplace, shoulder to shoulder, day by day, working with people, they get to see the real you. Because over time, you can't hide. You know, Maybe for the first few weeks, you can hide. But after a while, they watch you when the pressure's on. They see you react to things. And, and they learn. And, and how important it is that we are real, that we are authentic. He said, you could see it. You're my witness. I live the life in front of you, not from behind a, a, a lectern at the synagogue, but out when I was building tents and you were doing your woodwork and you were doing your leather work and you were, you know, we were out there in the real rumble, tumble life and you saw it. <laughs> when Paul was on house arrest, he writes about this in Philippians chapter 1. He was chained to a guard 24 hours a day. He could have visitors, but there was a guard chained to him every day. And he says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, that the gospel had spread throughout the palace guard. Now, how did that happen? Paul didn't go call all the guards together and say, I'm going to preach to you from my letter to the Colossians. <laughs> nah, they were chained to him. Paul couldn't get away from them, <laughs> and they couldn't get away from Paul. And as they're chained to him 24 hours a day, and as he receives visitors, and as they listen to him, and they observe his life, and they see him in, in that difficult time, they are so impressed by what they see from the real, authentic Paul that the guards become converted. And before long, all through the palace guards, it's almost like he's saying, you know, you get chained to me, you're going to become a follower of Christ. Which leads me to ask myself this question. If somebody were chained to me 24 hours a day, would they become closer to God or would they want to run away? Be real. Be authentic. Let your life show the reality of Christ. To do that, you have to be a person of integrity. 
He said, you are our witnesses and so is God. And here's how he defines this integrity. We lived holy and righteous and blameless. Wow. If you're going to influence somebody for God, you got to have these three things. Holy, that's an inner spirit that leads to obedience. That's our relationship toward God. Righteous means to treat people in the right way. That's our relationship toward others. So holy is our relationship to God. Righteous is our relationship to others. And by the way, if you have a right relationship with God, you will have a right relationship with others. And then blameless. That's an interesting word. It has to do with your reputation. And, and what it means is this. If someone makes an accusation against you, it won't stick. They, they, they aren't able to back it up. Because the people who know you will say, no, that's not right. And there won't be evidence for that accusation. Paul went through all kinds of accusations. But nothing could stick. And so be a person of integrity. How desperately we need integrity in our world today. Holy and righteous and blameless. And over and over and over, verse 1, verse 2, verse 5, verse 9, verse 10, he says, you know, you know, you know, they knew his life. And because they knew his life, he influenced them toward God. What do the people who know your life think about your relationship with God? And then he says, and here's a sneak peek for Father's Day. Because I, I, I think I'm going to pivot back to this verse on Father's Day. He says, be like a father. He's already told us to be nourishing like a mother. Now he says, be like a father. Verse 11, you know we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. And then he uses three important words. Encouraging, now the King James used the word exhorting, but it's more accurate, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God. Here's a mini Father's Day sermon, but it's not just for fathers, it's for all of us as we influence people. The word encourage means to be called alongside to help. If you're going to influence people, you need to be a helper. <laughs> you need to be called alongside of them to help. The word comfort is a really interesting word. It has with it the idea of encouragement, and it has with it the idea of helping calm people down and it has the idea of inspiring them to continue you ever need somebody to calm you down a little bit <laughs> I heard somebody say the other day they were kind of flying off the handle about something and and they said that's why I need him in my life he keeps me grounded you know we need people in our life to keep us calm and don't we need to be inspired you know, we talked about keep going when it's tough. Well, you need somebody to inspire you to be able to keep going when it's tough. And then the word urging is also an interesting word. It, it, it means to give testimony. In other words, when you're challenging somebody to live for God, you are backing that up with your testimony. You are backing that up with your life. <laughs> when, when Brian was coaching I, I used to try to sit behind the bench when I could because a lot of things happen on a bench you know at a football game that you don't really see going on I remember one time you know there's always those rah-rah people going up and down the bench saying we can do this we got this we can do this it was fascinating to watch the people on the team's reaction to different people who were doing that I remember one game, those guys, man, he, he was just messing up. He wasn't running the right routes. Quarterback put the ball in his hands. He's dropping it. And they come off the field and up and down, on, and they sit on the bench. And this kid, 
who's just been messing up all game long, is going up and down the bench saying, we got this, we can do this, hang in there. And you could visibly see the players on that team just wanted to punch him. It's like, what business do you have telling us to do? You do your job and we'd be in a whole lot better shape. Urging somebody includes, I'm backing it up with my life. And it's one thing to tell somebody to live the Christian life. It's another thing to encourage somebody to live the Christian life when they see you living the Christian life. So you could kind of put it like this. The exhorting or encouraging is, I'm here for you. I'm called alongside of you. I'm here. Whatever you need, whatever I can do for you, I'm here. Comfort is, you can do this. I have confidence in you. I, I know you can do this. It might be tough right now. I know you can do this. And urging is, God is calling you to do this. And I know that with his help, you'll be able to do it. And I'm going to be here with my testimony and my encouragement to support you in it. Now that's going to preach on Father's Day. <laughs> but I hope it preaches a little bit today. If you want to influence somebody, please make sure you have those three roles. Please make sure that you're an encourager. Man, do we need encouragement. I um, got a note from my dad this morning. And by the way, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can always stand in encouragement. Got an email from my dad this morning. Just wanted you to know that I'm praying God will be with you in every way today. Wow, <laughs> what a good way to start the day encouragement comfort you can do this I have faith in you I know it's hard but I know God's put something inside of you and you're going to be able to do this this is what God is calling you to do stay strong and I'll right here, be right here with you that's being a spiritual influencer not hollering at somebody from behind a pulpit not you know posting vitriol on social media. It's saying, I'm going to walk with you through this life. I'm going to share my life with you. I'm going to be real. I've got you. God's got you. You can do this. Oh, how desperately people in your life need that from you. So if somebody were chained to you, would they be more apt to follow God <laughs> or not? Let's be spiritual influencers. Father, this world desperately needs Christians to act like Christians. I just realized that I could have preached this sermon from you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, because that's what you're calling us to do as salt and light is to be an influence in our society. And Lord, I know when, when I scroll through Twitter and there's somebody that I don't even know, but I guess because I'm one of his followers and so many people are following him, every day he says, I want you to know I prayed for you today. And what an encouragement that is. I know he probably just said, Lord, for everybody that reads this, bless them. But Lord, you answer prayers like that. And I pray that you would help us to be positive spiritual influencers. We may not think we have much influence, but Lord, I, I think one of the exciting things about heaven is when we get there and we're able to see the impact we had that we didn't even realize. People coming up to us that maybe we don't even know who they are who say, I read something that you put on Facebook or I listened to something online or I know your kids or something that our influence reached out far beyond our knowledge. So Lord, help us to be careful to make sure that we're living holy and righteous and blameless lives. Help us to be encouragers. Help us to be cheerleaders. Help us to let people know that by the help of God, they can do what he's called them to do. And Lord, maybe some of us need to hear that today. That by the help of God, I can do what God has called me to do. 
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being here today.